Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, get started today. It is my true honor and pleasure to be giving the introduction today for Dr. Susan Margulies, who is coming to us now as the Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation and the Head of the Engineering Directorate. Um, the reason it's such a pleasure for me to introduce Susan is because I've had um, the fortune of uh, receiving her mentorship and learning from her science as well over the last decade or so. Um, I'll just give a very brief background on uh, Susan. She's originally from Minnesota and did her, uh, her engineering undergraduate work at Princeton University Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Now, Susan is a pioneer in, in, uh, in a number of senses. At Princeton, she was, I, I believe it was the fifth class uh, where after Princeton first admitted women. It used to be a boys only school. And I'm sure in the, uh, I imagine in the engineering department, it was um, thin to start in, 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 uh, in females. So she was really a, a pioneer there. She then went on after her undergraduate degree to uh, a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, which I believe was in the bioengineering department. And um, Susan looks very young. You won't be able to tell this because of her, 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 her face mask, of course. But this was decades before we had a bioengineering department here at Stanford and preceding many other bioengineering uh, departments around the country. So Pennsylvania was an early bioengineering department and uh, Susan had a very successful PhD there where she pioneered um, uh, a, a primate model that I have uh, read on extensively. And, and part of the reason, again, it's such an honor to introduce Susan is because she is an academic hero of mine. I've benefited not just from her mentorship, but learning from her her science, and she's really a, a giant in the field. That was recognized um, again about five years ago when she was recruited. Uh, she, she went on to have the bulk of her faculty career also at University of Pennsylvania, studying both traumatic brain injury and uh, lung injury. And about five years ago, she was recruited to Georgia Tech Emory, which is an eminent um, combined biomedical engineering department that almost acts like a school. And she became the chair there. Um, and, uh, and I, I recently visited her there, and, and she's done a fantastic job from all accounts. And only as of in the, last, in the last year, I believe, she's taken this new really important position. And so Susan is uh, essentially heading engineering for our National Science Foundation. Without further ado, I will uh, ask Susan to come up to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really lovely. I really appreciate it. So I, I'm going to begin by saying thank you for saying that I look younger. Today is my birthday, and so I'm one year older. I, I turn my phone off because I've got all kinds of family and, and lab members are texting me, and so it's my pleasure to spend my birthday with you. Um, so as my grandmother would say, one never rebuilds one's age, but thank you for the compliment that I look younger than I really am, so I appreciate it. So it's my pleasure to talk with you today about the NSF and more specifically about some really exciting opportunities at the National Science Foundation's Engineering Directorate and to share with you how we're really thinking about the importance of engineering in the role today for really urgent problems in our society. So what I'm going to be sharing with you a bit about the Engineering Directorate and the broad scope that it has, but also some visioning that we're doing already in my first six months as leading the Engineering Directorate. So I would also then share with you what are some of the initiatives that we have going on right now that align with those goals and then share a little bit with where we're headed. So it's really exciting for me to talk to you in the room, as well as those of you who are listening to us uh, virtually and watching us virtually. So the National Science Foundation mission is quite broad. It's really to promote the progress of all science. Unlike mission-oriented agencies like NASA, we really are a very broad oriented agency and to it, the focus is on advancing the national health, prosperity and welfare and to secure national defense. And I always love just like and other duties, yes, and for other purposes as well. So NSF is a large director at 8.5 billion. And as you'll see in a moment, the, uh, the budget we hope will be increasing dramatically and we really have an impact across NSF very broadly on both research and education. 
So I'd like to add a, a little uh, a plug here for California about how much NSF funding, this is not engineering directorate funding alone, but NSF funding is coming to the state of California. And as you can see, Stanford is number two in the state for receiving NSF funding. Um, I know that there's a little bit of competition between other institutions within the state. I'm giving you the data and I leave it to you to change that number. Um, if you don't apply, of course, you don't receive awards. So the beginning is increase those applications and let those competitive juices flow here. So I like to say that at NSF, we do things at small scales and large scales. We do things early in the discovery pipeline. We do things later in the discovery pipeline. And so this slide is really meant to really orient you to the breadth of the missions agency, from single investigators to mid-sized teams to huge centers and networks. This is all within our mission, within the engineering directorate as well. From a single discipline through convergence research. This morning I talked with one of the chairs here and convergence is a new word. It's a word that we've actually now articulating, but this is old school to us in engineering. We know that you have to have multiple people at the table to define what the important problems are and to carry out really innovative solutions to have the broadest impact. Convergence is a word that's now being used across all of NSF. It's different than multidisciplinary. I like to say that multidisciplinary is more like a quilt that brings together, makes a beautiful pattern with all of those present. But actually, convergent research is seen as much more of a mixture of different materials into a solution where the solution looks so different from those components. So it's not just bringing people together for their strength that they bring to the fabric of the whole problem, but it's really thinking that by coming together with multiple disciplines, you imagine the problem differently and the solutions differently. So it really is a different word needs to be defined because it can have so many definitions. Career stage is important because we go from not only undergraduates and graduate students to postdocs, early faculty careers, and later in the careers as well. I personally feel that we need to address more at the middle career age, uh, kind of stage, and I'm going to uh, commit to working towards that and keeping people engaged in NSF. We do have people who turn to NSF for all of their funding or much of their funding throughout their entire career path. I believe that that group could be broadened. And when I think about innovation cycle from basic research through translational research, this is really important, especially in the engineering directorate, to understand that engineers don't just take somebody else's science and move it on to practice. We have fundamental discovery in engineering that quite frankly, I think we need to have a, do a better job at sharing, not just from campuses, but also from the NSF, about the important impact that that fundamental discovery within engineering has to really increase an understanding of what engineers do. And I think this is a, a struggle that we've had. I've, I look to the National Academy of Engineering, which will be having a, a special symposium on really increasing the visibility, the public awareness of what engineering is. And at the NSF, I also want to be doing that. I think it's something we struggle with on all of our campuses as well. And I've been at the University of Pennsylvania, at Georgia Tech, and at Emory. And I, I think we share that challenge of making sure that it's visible what engineers do. And uh, so it's, a, it's work that we share together. The National Science Foundation is shown here. We have seven directorates that are shown in blue and a number of offices. I just want to take a moment to have you focus on those faces. Six of the seven engineering directorate leaders are women. And we have four of the engineering directorate leaders, seven directorate leaders are people of color, persons of color. And it, I am delighted to serve at a leadership level that embraces diversity and inclusion so strongly. Within the engineering uh, directorate, I uh, show you that we have five um, uh, divisions within our directorate, as well as uh, an Office of Emerging Frontiers and Multidisciplinary Activities, which is where our EFRI program is, and you'll see more about that uh, in later slides. I like to think of this as a little bit like I'm the dean and there are, there are uh, department heads or, or, or chairs within each of these divisions. And we come together to really find vision that is across all of our divisions within the engineering directorate, but we also come together on a vision for the entire directorate. And you'll see more and more of that communication from us about that 
holistic vision as well as the vision of each of the divisions. Um, so the NSF budget as a whole, as you can see in dark blue, um, we consistently during uh, the previous administration would request a certain amount and get more. Well, that's great, right? Great. And you can see that the request here for fiscal 22, we are in the middle of fiscal 22. We still do not have a budget allocation. We have continuing resolution right now. So our uh, fiscal 22 budget <laughs> remains out there and we um, are working on our 21 budget right now in a continuing resolution. That's the amount that we're allocated right now. But we're still optimistic that as Congress continues to deliberate over fiscal 22, we're already planning 23. And it's as ambitious as our 22. So that's very exciting because the president also ad admits and acknowledges, embraces the fact that NSF is important in the mission of the priorities of the president. So we're fortunate to have received $600 million to all the agencies for the American Rescue Plan Act. And at NSF, we use some of this money uh, and at the engineering directorate, some of this money, and I'll highlight some of the ways that we've used it. The fiscal 22 budget is still under discussion. I, I've been in the position now for six months and it's been under discussion for all of those six months. Um, I find that this website a good one for you to know about if you wanna know about all the federal agencies and what's happening. This is from the American Institute for Physics and they keep track of uh, where things are going with appropriations and I encourage you to take a look at it. I looked very recently, it hasn't changed actually because uh, basically the budget is under discussion between the two. So what are the priorities for 22? The, the priorities for the National Foundation for the 22 budget request, which is under discussion, are shown here. It's really about enhancing that fundamental science that I told you is at the early stage, but also the development of that fundamental science and engineering as it moves along to, to uh, implementation, to strengthen U.S. leadership in emerging technologies, advance equity in science and engineering. You'll see that in several different ways to really continue to address equity in science and engineering is a high priority for the president, but as well for the director and for every directorate. To advance climate science and sustainability research and to continue construction of forefront of infrastructure. All of these engineering has a strong engagement in and are strongly aligned with our goals as well. Within engineering, the climate science and, and sustainability research is across all of our divisions, actually. So we're in a position to not only fund the first part, which is general engineering uh, research, but also particular focus areas. And you'll see more of those topical focuses. New in our fiscal 22 request was a, a horizontal, a new directorate and it was called out by each the House and the Senate as the importance of this new directorate, which is a horizontal to enhance use-inspired and translational research. For all of you who are engineers, we often have use-inspired. Sometimes it's application-inspired and not a specific use, but we really do focus on problems. We focus on pushing frontiers forward to be able to address the pr those problems at a very early stage. So the distance between what we're working on and the actual utilization of that in engineering can vary from it's a long way in the future, there'll be a baton that passes to someone else to I'm going to be the investigator that takes it from the basic discovery within the lab and I really want to translate that to a small business or to an industry sponsored contract and that that's really important for our own uh, scholarship. So we will be partnering very heavily and co-funding things with the Technology and Innovation uh, Partnerships uh, new directorate, as well as this directorate will take on some new innovative types of strategies because not everything, for example, will translate to a small business. For some, it's open, open source sharing for other types of translation. And this is an area that NSF is now gearing up to be able to address. So right now we do not have this directorate, but we're excited and hopeful that uh, with the fiscal 22 allocation, we'll be able to launch this new directorate. The president's office has R&D priorities, research and development priorities for fiscal 23. This is for the next year. You can see climate change is, is on it. Uh, pandemic readiness and prevention continues. We want to learn from this pandemic to prepare our responses for the next ones. Critical and emerging technologies, innovation for equity, I told you you would see that again, and national security and economic resilience. Engineering is firmly engage, engaged in all of these areas. 
So what is the vision of the engineering director and what are those conversations that we're, we've been having and we are continuing having? Rather than wait until it's perfectly baked and then launched, I wanted to share with you where we are with the conversation that we're having within the engineering directorate. Really how to position and give high, greater visibility towards what the engineering directorate does. So our focus and what really attracted me to this position this is a pivotal moment in our nation and in society for the role that engineering can play in the urgent issues of our time. Just a few of them are here on the slide, climate change, equitable access to education and to healthcare, critical and resilient infrastructure, to name just a few. Yesterday when I met with faculty and we talked about their research areas, these were uh, women and historically underrepresented faculty. Everybody at the table are studying urgent, prop urgent problems that need to be addressed where engineering plays a role. These are all within the NSF's engineering directorate in terms of their scope. It's a very broad mission in our directorate. So I just want to highlight it uh, for you just a few stories of a continued commitment by NSF and by the engineering directorate specifically to give you a sense of how engineering has had an impactful story that begins with basic discovery, engineering discovery in the lab, and has impacted society and continues to impact society with sustained investment. So this is about the story of wastewater surveillance from discovery to practice, I like to say. So over 20 years ago, NSF has uh, been funding uh, a wastewater surveillance. Initially, it, it, we needed the tools to be able to literally find treasure in the trash, to be able to identify genetic variants that were of interest in sewage. And that took a lot of development of engineering discovery methods to be able to do that. Those methods were tested in Ebola and Salmonella outbreaks. They were refined, new techniques were developed, and then um, the, the sensitivity and the specificity of the, of the methods and trying to get them to be point rather than uh, something that is available and, and uh, samples are sent to a centralized site, all of this was important. With the, uh, the um, pandemic funding that was received, we funded a lot of grants to be able to, over 20 grants to be from the engineering directorate alone, to really increase the sensitivity now for genetic variants of the COVID-19 uh, and to predict variant outbreaks before people were testing, right? So this is in your feces. This is, we discovered that actually you can detect the variants in the wastewater even after wastewater uh, processing. So uh, it was so important. The other thing that we funded were research networks that married together campuses with local governments and, and public health communities and uh, also with uh, clinical data to be able to coordinate the discoveries that we're finding. And it was so impactful because actually it validated with clinical results that wastewater uh, surveillance is really an important way uh, to really monitor and to intervene in public health capacity. It's a, it's a beautiful story of how engineering commitment can really make a difference in public health. Just two weeks ago, I joined a National Sewage Surveillance Interagency Leadership Council with representation you see here. And what we're really excited about is now sharing how we're making change moving forward, how we can coordinate the research efforts across these agencies to coordinate what we're funding and come together and make a huge impact in the future pandemics. We have right now a call for proposals. It's a predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention. It's not restricted to COVID and people are really putting in their ideas about what we need to be doing to prepare for future pandemics. Those proposals are under review right now. Another nice story is the engineering the biotechnology revolution. It's actually started with an ERC or an engineering research center funding um, 20 years ago, actually. And uh, that Sinberg, the synthetic biology, really developed the basic engineering tools to be able to manipulate genetic content, to manipulate uh, and create organoids, and to identify and put together the building blocks to make synthetic functional uh, basically for synthetic functional analogs. Um, it went from laboratory to practice with an FDA approved malarial treatment as well as many others. 
Now, right now, we see that the current uh, ERCs with uh, cell therapies and other therapies build on the shoulders of that early investment. These engineering research centers are major investments uh, and they are high risk and involve both engineering research and education with industry input and community input. This is an important way that we train the future generations in emerging areas of engineering, impactful engineering research and lay the groundwork for follow-on funding as individual grantees. What has come from this is a couple of things. I like to highlight that some of the, from Sinberg, some of the graduate students who, and postdocs who were on that started Ginkgo Bioworks. And Ginkgo Bioworks was just, uh, was launched about five years ago. And this fall went public with a valuation of over $15 billion to take what was part of that Sinberg ERC and now move it forward. In addition, the work of that ERC, as just using this one as an example, was so profound that it's generated new generations of researchers that take these tools and use them for additional applications. So much so that we now collaborate with the uh, and, uh, Department of Energy Biofoundry to provide that industrial readiness opportunity for investigators with NSF funding who need to test whether or not their discovery in the lab can translate to uh, industrial success. So um, building on the, the shoulders of, of uh, previous giants, in this case, Sinberg, uh, we really believe that those early stage investments and follow-on funding has really paid off. So these are the stories of engineering impact, where in this case, it's the biotechnology revolution. And long ago, as you can see, decades ago, the investment in nanotechnology really, and this was across NSF and included other agencies, as you can see, has resulted in a number, a number over the years of uh, current impact. So above the, the um, double helix, you can see the NSF investments across the decades, and below that you see the current impacts from those significant and early uh, stage investments. So we continue to want to find those stories of engineering impact. So we have funded uh, the, um, uh, a project called Extraordinary Engineering Impacts on Society, where we've commissioned the National Academies to identify at least 10 stories of this continuous investment, early stage investment that has changed society, that has changed fields, changed lives. So I look forward to extending our story to have many chapters. Um, I would recommend that if you think of ideas, please reach out to this committee They'll have a public event in the spring that both to share what they're thinking of, but also to gather stories that they may not have captured yet. So please reach out. One of the things when we think about moving forward in the distant, which direction should we be held, uh, should we be headed towards, and what policy should we be de developing, we um, have launched the Engineering Research Visioning Alliance about a year ago. These help us set the set the horizon targets of where we should be heading in terms of our calls for proposals and innovative new programs for HAPS. So recently there was a visioning event that was held uh, related to the role of engineering in combating, combating climate change. There's an important role of engineering in looking at solutions to climate change. That white paper is due in March. I'm excited to see it. And we will have, uh, uh, basically that will be public, and then we will be able to act on it. The next visioning event is in March, and it's called Leveraging Biology to Power the Engineering Impact. Please reach out to Irva if you have ideas for, uh, for summits that should be held to really envision where engineering can go. This is not where we are, but where we should be headed in terms of really directing our engineering communities to new horizons and new pathways. So we celebrated our uh, 40th an uh, anniversary of the engineering directorate just last year. We were established in 1981. And I'd like to say that we're working on what our mission is that's specific to the engineering directorate. And what we've come up with, and I would say it might be tweaked, but it's nearly, I would say, uh, gained a lot of um, enthusiasm, is that our mission to really embrace what is engineering is that we are transforming our world for a better tomorrow. By driving discovery, engineering discovery, inspiring innovation, enriching education, and accelerating access. And so this embraces the broad mission of the engineering directorate. But what we, I like to say is that we focus on the problems and the ideas. We focus on the people, 
the people who are training, the people where those challenges exist, because we alter our solutions knowing the priorities that of the communities that we are impacting and the people who we are going to impact with those solutions. And we focus on partnerships because doing it alone, we can go fast, but if we want to go far, we need to build those partnerships. Some of those partnerships that we're building right now are with communities, so, like, the, like the surveillance network that I talked about that in, involves not just other agencies, but communities. Some of those partnerships, of course, are with other agencies where we haven't been partnering, or we have partnerships but they're so limited. Let's expand them so that we can move together in a coordinated fashion. Some of those partnerships are actually within NSF, where historically engineering might not have partnered or partnered in different ways. And we're really trying to enlarge all of those partnerships. Some of the partnerships are with industry, and I highlight just a couple of them. So I, I promised you that I would tell you a little bit about how we use those uh, ARP funds and COVID-19 funds. We created engineering postdoc fellows, or e-fellows, recognizing that this was an important area that we were not funding. We were funding graduate students, undergraduates, we were funding faculty, but not postdocs. This is something that, as a directorate, we really hope to continue funding um, across our uh, directorate. You can see that we increased early career funding uh, in terms of career awards. We also created something called engineering research initiation for non-R1 institutions to be able to provide those resources for people to um, uh, have uh, um, equity in terms of the opportunity to be for their readiness for NSF funding. Mid-career funding is something we hope to continue as well. And then you can see on the right-hand side, not only research that's in the bottom right, but more startups that were related to COVID-19. And we created something that you'll see more of in a moment uh, in, in, that are, we call inclusive mentoring hubs. We ended up broadening that to a call that's called Broadening Participation in Engineering. And I have an entire slide dedicated to it. I highlighted earlier in the wastewater surveillance slide that we have a predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention solicitation. This is quite active. In typical NSF fashion, we have workshops. So that IRVO has workshops, right, about climate change and about leveraging biology for engineering impact. We had pandemic uh, prevention workshops, which then uh, really inspired call this call for proposals. Phase one deadline is October 1. Those uh, awards are, uh, those are, are, proposals are under review night right now. They're planning grants, essentially. And then phase two center grants uh, solicitation will go out uh, shortly. Signals in the soil uh, is another one that basically brings together communities in a convergent way across multiple directorates to really understand the science and technologies for new sensing systems. This is part of climate adaptation. We need to think of different ways to bring engineering to the challenges uh, in agriculture and uh, in other aspects. As you can see here, an important solicitation that we're dedicating um, important resources. Critical aspects of sustainability and innovative solutions to climate change is about improving sustainability. And you can see the uh, a Dear Colleague letter that was uh, out in just in the fall encourages proposals to all the directorates on these areas. I just want to highlight for you that a Dear Colleague letter is something that I had underappreciated until I joined NSF of how NSF is signaling to, to you, the community, an interest in funding things in this area through our traditional channels. Yes, I know as a PI, but there's not a set aside for that. But it's a way of telling you we are especially interested in this area. We are still uh, are interested in broadly, and these Dear Colleague letters are on the Engineering Directorate website and the NSF's website. And I encourage this campus to actually take solicitations and DCLs and, and get them out broadly to the research community here at Stanford. Civic Innovation Challenge is an interesting one because it understands that the research to innovation pipeline actually requires connection with communities to identify the problems that are important ones to solve to test them, test pilot, evaluate them in real communities, and then to uh, launch them. So this is early stage funding for pilots with the expectation that communities take on the next step because they see this as a success. So in uh, last year, we funded 52 teams. These were four month planning grants with communities. And then we funded 17 team awards. And I highlight a few of them on the next slide. 
<clears throat> we're in 22, we have one actively now, and you can see that the two topics are living in a changing climate, pre-disaster action around adaptation, resilience and mitigation, and bridging the gap between essential resources and services and community needs. That is broadly defined, lots of essential services. But if I could point you to the current funded projects, this is in collaboration, I mentioned partnerships, in funding collaboration with the Department of Energy on communities and mobility, and with the Department of Homeland Security on resilience to natural disasters. So in the next slide, I just highlight just a few of them. So I'm gonna tell you about the top one, just because it happens to be Atlanta, and that's where I'm from. I could have picked lots of them. Um, and in this one, in the pandemic, ridership has gone down on MARTA. How can we utilize those vehicles and that infrastructure to create something that is meet, meeting the needs of today's workforce? So basically, is an on-demand service that, that MARTA never had. And this project is a 12-month pilot with an evaluation period with the hope that the community takes this on. So Civic is an example of a partnership now with local communities. In the previous director's term, we came up with 10 big ideas to really make a difference that across all NSF, engineering has participated in nine of these 10 big ideas. And I'm just gonna highlight how we've participated in just a few of them. One of them is mid-scale research infrastructure, which is providing experimental research capacities, capabilities at a range between six million max, which is the, the max for the uh, major research instrumentation awards, and major facilities, which is 100 million. So there was a type one, which was basically up to 20 million, six to 20, and then there's a type two from 20 million up to 100 million. And you can see the awards here, some of which you can see are in California, but the, um, it's important to, for you to understand that there's a commitment to continue this. This has been an unmet need, and so while this was a big idea, the big ideas do continue, and those funding for those continue. They've been successful. This is about creating and restoring America's infrastructure that is in that middle range that historically has been a penumbra and not funded by NSF. Convergence accelerators have a, a, a multi-year timeline, so you can see that there were topics from fiscal year 22 that continue to be funded because they're fa multiple phases, fiscal 21 topics, and the current year topics are here. We encourage you to look for these topics. This convergence accelerator is really about bringing together in that way that is a, truly a solution rather than a quilt uh, um, of a wide variety of fields. The future of human work at the uh, future of work at the human technology frontier, I think, was actually prophetic. Why? <laughs> because we so need to understand the results of these studies of the big idea, because we are facing that now on our campuses, in our industries, and uh, in the federal agencies. How are we defining the future of work and how we interact with technology in many different aspects. And these, there's, uh, this continues and the deadline is in March, early March. Advanced wireless is critical. If we found out uh, one thing in this pandemic, this was critical for online education and we do have a problem with equity in access to wireless. And so there's a considerable investment that's been made uh, by the engineering directorate and you can see that we are participating actively. The AI Research Institutes launch, were launched new, and there were 11 new AI Research Institutes, with uh, three that were sponsored by the Engineering Directorate listed here. And in fiscal 22, uh, we continue to, to have a call. This is where their locations are, and you can see California is well um, supported. But uh, we, this is such an important, AI is not something that's only for uh, some uh, subsets of fields. AI is, is a tool that can be harnessed and put to good use for many different areas. Biotechnology, I highlighted our revolution in biotechnology. We continue to have several different uh, calls that you can see here highlighted in the current year. I encourage you to find your match or a colleague's match on this slide. I'll make these slides available for distribution to this audience. Future manufacturing is a key area of investment for engineering continues to be a key investment. This is uh, the three different tracks. I just, uh, the solicitation now is live uh, as of earlier this week for fiscal 22. And you can see the investment from the past year. Um, when I first uh, joined the NSF, these numbers were astounding. What, 31 million for this, 
15 million for that as a PI, you know, this idea of, of tens of million dollars and again and again and again. Our, our uh, budget is nearly a billion dollars in the engineering directorate, so the opportunity to really have that impact in the nation year after year is a wonderful uh, and empowering opportunity for both research and education. These three tracks remain absolutely relevant and are continuing in the current call. Quantum science and engineering is another area where we are continuing to invest, and you'll see solicitations there. Research infrastructure, as I highlighted, uh, are important. Here in California and here we have the, the National Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure Investment, with um, important for modeling, simulation, and computational tools to manage, analyze, and understand critical data having to do with wind, water, and earthquake hazards. And you can see the NNCI, which Stanford participates in here, and Network for Computational Nanotechnology is highlighted as well here. So it is important to bring people together to make more than just a sum of the parts in these types of networks. Just going to briefly highlight for you now some engineering, uh, some partnerships that we have in engineering with industry. Because I truly believe that having industry engaged early on in research helps us as engineers to focus the basic research in areas and to expose our trainees with an industry mindset. And quite frankly, I've been impressed with how these centers bring together competitive industries to the same table to, to give their insight in a pre-competitive space to academia. Because these are tend to be, at least the uh, engineering research centers are always multi-institutional, the industry university cooperative research centers can be a single institution, and we encourage multiple institution networks. This is really having an, a value added of bringing industry to the table early, seeing what your campus is doing, and hopefully with follow-on individual investigator uh, funding directly from industries. So I wanted to highlight where we're going with our fourth generation of engineering research centers. Well, we were established in 1981 as an engineering directorate. In the mid-80s, it was identified that we really needed to have this melding of industry, research, and education together at the table, and engineering research centers were born. The National Academies published a white paper just a few years ago about suggestions for how we can update the Engineering Research Center concept, and you'll see that on the next slide. So four new ERCs were funded in fiscal 20, and you see them here with some of the sites in California. And uh, that's interesting. Here. So uh, the, the, uh, in being responsive to the National Academies uh, evaluation, we now are asking in the current solicitation, we are asking for an engineering systems focus to recognize that this is a system approach to take uh, with, with, uh, with launching the solutions and the investigations uh, of the topic of the investigators choosing. These are five-year awards that undergo an evaluation for renewal for another five years. We actually want those initial applications to think about a 10-year strategic plan. It allows you to have the mindset from the beginning of what does the next five years look like. That may change along the way, but we want the visioning to be there up front. It's a longer range view. It allows people to take higher risk pathways. We want faculty committed to convergent research with, inter -institution, with, with institutional and multidisciplinary teams. We want to have an emphasis on the societal impact of the work that's being proposed. And the competition for fiscal 22 is underway. Those evaluations are taking place now. And the next solicitation, I've just approved and submitted it up the, the chain for approval. You'll be seeing that solicitation launched. We have many mid-size interdisciplinary engineering research opportunities, and they're listed here. I want to focus on EFRI, which is the emerging frontiers of the research and innovation that you can see on the bottom of this slide. That is where it's a collation, a collection from our communities of ideas. I mentioned IRVA, the Engineering Research Visioning Alliance, identifying future VISTAs. What we do in EFRI is we're identifying a nearer view VISTA, if you will, 
of where we should be studying. We ask for the communities to tell us about that, internal and external communities. We then have briefings and workshops with academia, industry, and government, and then we select those topics. The two current topics right now are on this slide. Brain-inspired dynamics for engineering energy-efficient circuits and artificial intelligence. Well, this is recognizing that brain is so energy efficient as well as efficient in, sort of in terms of computational um, time. How do we understand and apply that dynamical neuroscience to leverage unique features using it for applications such as AI systems? Engineered living systems is a second path and that topic aims to leverage the capacities of living cells and organisms for not necessarily biological utilities, but rather to design, fabricate, manufacture, and model engineered living systems that might not be the, the living system from which that cell came. I want to turn our attention to what I promised we would turn our attention to, and that is broadening participation in engineering, broadening access to education and research. The director's vision has been since he began nearly a year and a half ago, the three pillars to advance the frontiers of NSF research into the future, to ensure accessibility and inclusivity, and to secure global leadership in the science and engineering. In, in order to ensure accessibility and inclusivity, one of the big ideas was NSF includes national networks that come together. And you can see the, the new ones that just were um, announced this past year um, in the summer. And one of them, you can see the, the third bullet, the fourth bullet is Engineering Plus. It's the first includes network for engineering. It's a partnerships launched for underrepresented students. I encourage Stanford to think about how they may partner with other institutions to launch an includes network. The science and engineering indicators were released in late January. And in that presentation, and the next few slides are from that presentation, I was really struck with the work that we have to do in engineering. So I wanted to share the data with you and share opportunities that we have right now for broadening participation in engineering and ask for your energy towards this uh, languishing situation. So this is across all of STEM. And what you see with the open images are uh, 100,000 people, each of those little images, that we would need to bring our science and engineering workforce to their demographic in our US population. And you can see with a tremendous amount of work here, highlighted now just for women, Hispanic or Latino, Black and African American, American Indian and Alaska Native. How do we manage that work? This is data now limited to only our PhDs. And if you focus in the middle of this slide, you see engineering. The open area of the purple box is really our, is our Hispanic and Latino, that's the work we have to do to attract Hispanic and graduate Hispanic and Latino PhD applicants and students. Um, the uh, black and African American is that uh, terracotta color, and you can also see the, two, the smaller squares for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. We have a lot of white open squares. We have a lot of work to do at the PhD level. Why is this so important? Here you see longitudinally over nearly 20 years, and I'm going to point out, so I'm not sure some of you might not hear me, but I'm going to point out here, where is engineering? Here's engineering here in male population. You can see female population is up here in the third. It's a very small stripe. These are four-year undergraduates, bachelor's degrees, associate degrees are indicated here. We are not making progress in engineering, in ch moving the needle, in this case, for men and women. And it's so important because in our pandemic, when we gathered data about on the y-axis, you can see unemployment rates. The solid green here is the dip in unemployment, the increase, if you will, in unemployment during the pandemic STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, and math degrees, were resilient. And you can see the dashed green line, those are STEM careers where they don't have STEM degrees. So if we manage to focus some of our educational initiatives on workforce retraining, people whose undergraduate and graduate degrees were not in engineering, for example, we can actually increase 
the economic resilience of our communities. Um, and so we have work to do. What type of workforce development are we funding right now? We have research experiences for undergraduates, and you can see several others here. We had supplements for underrepresented uh, groups in terms of research experiences and mentoring. Uh, research experiences and mentoring is REM. We also have research experiences for teachers. We have student designs related for NSF research. All of these have begun focusing on opportunities for increasing the diversity, inclusion, and retention of our um, of our students uh, from historically underrepresented groups. Semiconductor workforce, we're working on that. We know there's a global shortage. We're working on lab to fab capabilities. We're working on increasing research in this area at NSF uh, across multiple directorates. And recently, NSF and SRC partnered to support research experiences for undergraduate for semiconductor training in industry. And this is important, and I want you to realize that we also have a, a recent call for semiconductor synthetic biology circuits and communications that was just launched this last week, actually. So EFRI planning grants uh, are uh, supplements to promote diverse, uh, not supplements, these are grants to promote diverse participation on teams. So what we're trying to do is to open doors so that campuses like yours can really respond to the challenge to move the needle in the diversity, inclusion, and retention of our uh, historically underrepresented students. So I promised you that I would describe a little bit about our broadening participation and engineering solicitation. It involves four tracks, planning grants and conference grants on how we can encourage participation of all citizens in the engineering enterprise. This is students, faculty. This is includes uh, training for uh, our faculty on campus and mentoring for our faculty on campus as well. These have no deadlines, so continuous submission. Continuous submission for research into broadening participation, taking a scholarly approach, not just trying things and wondering if they'll work, but really taking a scholarly approach. And I'd like to draw your attention to two new tracks in the broadening participation and engineering uh, solicitation. Inclusive mentoring hubs, which are really trying to welcome all uh, um, participants to be able to address how we encourage and, and inclusive, equitable behaviors and uh, environments on our campuses. And this is not only covering K through 12, undergraduates, graduate students, faculty at early stage, faculty at later stages. PIs can be societies, can be campuses. We encourage multiple uh, sites for these uh, inclusive mentoring hubs because we recognize that multiple perspectives will be important. And centers for equity in engineering. These are actually begin on one campus and extend to more campuses uh, in the later years of these grants. The Centers for Equity and Engineering recognize, whereas mentoring hubs could be in one discipline, Centers for Equity and Engineering require the dean to be PI. This is about moving the needle on campuses. Oftentimes there's one or maybe two departments or schools that are really doing a lot of uh, great work. But this is about changing the culture on a campus and in those later years across multiple campuses. Both of the hubs and the centers are uh, encouraged to connect with the INCLUDES network. So the, my, this is my second to last slide. To just summarize that in the engineering budget, you can see that we have a, a, a research budget that I like to say if it's a nonprofit where you give your money to the, some foundation that you hope will do good. One of the questions I asked when I first joined NSF is how much of our budget is used for extramural funding of projects? And the answer is 96% of our budget is used and goes out the door to uh, PIs uh, that are sometimes students, as you know, and, and faculty, as well as to startups and to other uh, purposes. So one of the things I really want to work on as the assistant director leading the engineering directorate is that diamond in the middle with a competitive award rate of only 20%. We have a lot of people who are addressing in very high quality ways important problems. And I'm working through partnerships to be able to increase the funding rate. We touch on many people, and you can see here on the right, these people of course are senior researchers, graduate students, and undergraduates. 
but you can see a large number of people who's in, the, in our workforce who are touched by the funding that we create. And it's a real privilege to be able to lead the engineering directorate to really try and expand the impact even further. So I want to leave you with an opportunity to engage with us. I think that th one of our challenges is to demystify NSF, to encourage faculty to reach out to the program directors directly. And we work on different ways to do that. I talked with somebody this morning who said they went to a workshop that was really for people who wanted to apply for a particular type of solicitation and how helpful it was to be at that workshop and to really learn what was meant by the words of the solicitation. We are doing that more and more. But don't wait for a solicitation. If you have some work and you wonder which, which part of our directorate would fund it or to want the connection, if, if that's appropriate, to another directorate and another program officer, we were happy to make that connection please reach out. And as you can see here, as I mentioned before, please stay in touch with our requests for information, our meta programs, which come out and just indicate kind of our emphasis in a particular area across multiple programs and directorates, our, our dear colleague letters and our solicitations. Please, I encourage you to reach out with your suggestions directly to me. Thank you. Happy to take your questions. Yes. I was interested to see and wasn't aware that there's now a postdoctoral fellowship mm -hmm. uh, within the engineering directorate. I saw the number was still pretty small yep. at the end, under 500. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what that program currently does and if there's any thoughts for what it might be able to do in the future, especially in regards to equity and inclusion, because on our campus, that's where we see a really big drop yep. in diversity mm -hmm. and of course that's the that is a um, gateway that is required to reach the junior faculty ranks so we had a call for data this week it's friday this week uh, for uh, information about what we're doing in terms of equity programs and that's the one we called out we decided we could have talked about lots of them we called out that one um, we have not had those called e-fellows we had not had that before. And so we used that ARP funding to create a program that wasn't there before. And the, uh, with an emphasis on also supporting historically underrepresented campuses, and it includes EPSCOR states, and, uh, and also st students, right? Why did we cr launch that? Well, there were, there were no jobs. You know, hiring really shut down during the pandemic, and we recognized we were going to lose a generation of graduate students who didn't have the option of going on to the professoriate. And so it was a very important program to launch. It has been very successful. So right now, as we look at our budgets for 23, we're actually thinking about how can we, how can we preserve this program? Because we feel it is an important continuing need. And just this morning, we talked about the importance of agency for these individuals to be able to write a proposal on what they want to study. It creates a different mindset then for the postdoc. When you're, just our graduate fellowships are the same way. When you're applying as a, a, you know, you're applying with your ideas, it opens up doors for places that you might be able to do that postdoc where they might not have had a slot that was available and allows you to say, I've got my own funding for my, for my stipend, you know, do you, I'd like to work in your lab. So did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. I want you to connect back to the last slide you showed about the funding rate and then the initial uh, wonderful numbers on the increase in budget that the NSF has yep. received even after the request. So I was wondering if that trend continues, and I really hope that that's true, do you think that that increase in funding would mostly go to funding the current programs? Or do you think there will be new programs that will be started as a consequence of that? I want there to be. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, w with this funding rate so low and the hope that our budget will be higher, will the new delta be used for new programs or to increase the funding rate? And the answer is I hope it's both. And that's a, a discussion that we're having right now as a leadership team. So, I asked each. Uh, Sometimes we have conversations together as a team. You'll probably also do this within your own labs. Sometimes it's best to have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's best to have as a, as a group. And I do both as well with our leadership. So I, I wanted to ask, 
what are the, what are the most pressing goals that you want to see to have accomplished by 2030 in the directorate? We will always be funding things to the next frontier, but what do you want to have accomplished? And it revealed a true priority of increasing two things, the number of awards that are funded, regardless of whether it's a new program or not, the number of awards that are funded, the size of the awards, and also these pressing areas where we must make a commitment. So that's actually broadening it beyond the increasing from 20%. Larger awards, it could come from different mechanisms, more mid-scale awards. It could that the standard award is a larger award. Thinking about increasing the size of the award, and then also thinking about those emerging areas that do need engineers to address them. So it will be a mixture. Yeah. Yes. I just want to say I'm really glad to hear that because I was on the Committee of Visitors for Size a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and when we looked at the data, one of the things we saw is that there was an intention to increase the award funding rate, but then the awards had been successively shrinking in size. And this was creating all kinds of difficulties where then, you know, a career award wasn't actually supporting a faculty member, couldn't actually support a graduate student in some institutions. And so the idea that, yeah, there is sort of a, a trade-off there, but the fact that you're looking at both increasing the number of awards as well as the size of the So the question was about just expressing appreciation for looking at not just increasing the number of awards, but also the size of awards. I can tell you that the first answer for every division director was both. I want both. And I said, I know, just like you love both your children equally, but you know, like which one would you put before the next one? And uniformly, they said the number of awards and then the size. So we'll have to decide at what point are we trading off, right? And I do have to tell you that we have a conversation. We have these exciting solicitations, exciting DCLs. We're increasing the denominator of the number of, of uh, applications that are being submitted. And we're acutely conscious that the more we make exciting opportunities, the more people will be applying it. And that number is threatened. So we need to meet the need. Thank you. So is it, are there any online questions? I actually am not sure how to capture that. No? OK, good. That's OK. You, anyone who's online can always reach out to me with your questions as available. Yes? Uh, to what extent, following up on Sarah's question for postdocs, to what extent have there been conversations about like transition to faculty type of hmm. grants within NSF that kind of, again, follow the investigator and might play a critical role in diversifying? That's interesting. So the question is about transition to faculty awards. These are often two-phase awards, right, uh, where part of it is to supporting a postdoctoral uh, independent area of research that then can follow you uh, and uh, like a, a K999, R00, often affectionately called kangaroo grants from NIH. Um, we have not had that conversation. Um, I think you bring up something very interesting because it really allows for that important support in the same way Graduate Research Fellowship opens doors when you're looking at uh, opportunities. Uh, those awards, those tr career transition awards also open opportunities. I'll share with you what we have are two pieces, right? You're at a campus, especially the uh, Engineering Research Initiation Award for non-R1 institutions. You're at a campus and those funds can be used for personnel, right, to fund students. They can be used for equipment. They can be used for research studies. It's identifying the fact that the resource disparity across institutions in, at an early stage can really have a profound effect on your success rate in entering, even to put in a career award. So we, it, this is a pre-career award often type of uh, opportunity. But you're talking about something that's much earlier and then has a linkage. And at this point, while we would not have it planned uh, as a possibility, I think it's a great suggestion to start thinking about it. Thank you. All right, well, I am conscious that we are over time. Oh, you have a question? Well, I, I was going to ask a little bit of a big picture question. Of mm -hmm. You know, th this goal of increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, engineering, mm -hmm. and NSF being somewhat limited to higher education. Now, I know there's money that goes through universities and down, you know, uh, uh, career awards, et cetera. But 
Um, is there a reason why NSF can't reach further into? Oh, NSF does. So the the question was about for broadening participation. Why is it that we start NSF starts at the undergraduate and and goes older, if you will? So we're under we're discussing now potential changes for our Red Grant, which is revolutionizing engineering departments. That is a grant that is in collaboration with EHR, or the um, Education and Human Resources Directorate. They focus primarily at K through 12, but they also have the undergraduate and the graduate students. So they are the source for our graduate research fellowship program sits in EHR. So they do the spectrum of education, but they do science and engineering. So um, sometimes I'm sort of raising my hand to say, you know, engineers aren't like scientists. We actually have different educational experiences that are critical to educating, not just at the undergraduate and graduate level. So we believe in experiential learning. We value experiential learning. That's not the same across all of STEM, if you will, okay? So yes, we focus on, on those levels as well. And we don't have an engineering training for K through 12 right now. Uh, but I think it would be an interesting thing to think about. We already have the mechanism within NSF that would be partnership between Engineering Directorate and EHR. Yeah. All right, I want to thank you all. It's such a pleasure to be here to see your campus. I'm glad you dialed in beautiful weather for me. I appreciate that as well on my birthday. And for me, I just want to leave you with an open invitation to reach out to me. How can I help demystify NSF? How can I help connect you with the part of NSF that is the part that can most help you in, in the success of your own scholarly career, whether you're a student or whether you're a postdoc or whether you're a faculty member? Thank you so much. Let's give Susan a round of applause.